What can we learn from the Platonic dialogue, the Protagoras, where Socrates challenges the sophist Protagoras? Was Protagoras correct when he asserts that virtue can be taught? Was Socrates correct when he asserts that virtue cannot be taught? And can they both be right? And what are the components of virtue? Were all these components needed to be virtuous? And why was Socrates so hostile towards the sophists? Was it the sophists who were corrupting the youth of Athens? And these two questions we reflected on in our prior video in the life of the sophist Protagoras and the fragments that survive of his work. To understand the Platonic Dialogues, we need to understand the Peloponnesian Wars, which Athens lost to Sparta shortly before the composition of the Dialogues, and the history of the 30 tyrants who were installed by Sparta, who were overthrown for their bloodthirsty tyranny. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Socrates debates Protagoras respectfully, but in the dialogue, Socrates always wins the debate. Often the loser of the debate looks for an excuse to leave the dialogue after Socrates makes a fool out of them. But Protagoras does concede when Socrates wins an argument, and it is Socrates who gets up to leave the debate. Some of Socrates' arguments don't seem to make any logical sense. Some scholars speculate that these faulty arguments are spoofing how sophists reason imprecisely, concerning themselves more with rhetoric or pleasing speech, and are less concerned with logic and truth. Because, as we all know, whatever sounds best is deemed by most listeners to be true. And we need to only look so far as our presidential debates to confirm that. The main debate is about defining virtue and whether virtue can be taught. Protagoras argues that virtue can be taught, whereas Socrates says it cannot be taught. Are these two philosophers arguing about whether virtue is a skill or whether virtue is a choice? And the dialogue ends without a conclusion. Socrates wants his students to think for themselves, so we cannot assume that Socrates really believes that virtue cannot be taught. After all, at the end of the dialogue, Socrates asserts that true knowledge leads to virtue. Perhaps he seeks to dissuade the youth in Athens from studying under the sophists, who claim to be able to teach anything, for a fee, a generous fee, of course. And what example comes to mind if we assert that virtue can be taught? We need to go no further than the Book of Judges, which is filled with horrible stories that atheists love to parade as proof that God is not a loving God. And we must keep in mind the constant theme of the Book of Judges. Everyone in Israel did what was right in his own eyes which is the slogan of the sophists. Unusually for someone whom Socrates defeats in an argument, Plato has Protagoras graciously closing the dialogue. Socrates, I am not of a base nature, and I am the last man in the world to be envious. I cannot but applaud your energy and your conduct of an argument. As I have often said, I admire you above all men whom I know, and far above all men of your age. I believe that you will become very eminent in philosophy, and let us come back to the subject at some future time. And of course, the irony is that it is Socrates who is the eminent philosopher. Only fragments survive of Protagoras' works. In a later dialogue, Plato does discuss the philosophy of Protagoras in the Theotetus. Socrates argues that knowledge is not sense, perception, or true judgment. Now, many of the Platonic dialogues are commentaries on the Peloponnesian Wars. The Athenians knew the background of each of the participants, and so should we to properly interpret the dialogues. Protagoras is an early dialogue, and the symposium is suspected to be a later dialogue. But it is odd that many of the guests at P Plato's symposium participated in the arguments in the Protagoras. In the symposium, Alcibiades, quite drunk, crashed the dinner party at the end, after Socrates gave an eloquent speech on divine love. Alcibiades relates how he tried to seduce Socrates, but Socrates was only interested in loving him with a divine love, seeking to improve his soul. And Alcibiades so respected his teacher that he did not touch him. Callias is hosting Protagoras at his home. Callias was an Athenian general in the war. He defeated Sparta in the battle at Corinth and negotiated a peace. Callias hosted Xenophon's Symposium, but did not attend Plato's Symposium. But in later life, Callias spends his entire fortune on sophists, flatterers, and women and dies broken, forgotten. Now, Critias was a leader of the Thirty Tyrants, and he was a guest speaker at Xenophon's Symposium, but not Plato's. 
The 30 tyrants were installed as leaders of Athens by the victorious Spartans when Athens lost the Peloponnesian Wars. They were overthrown after a bloody short reign where they executed first their opponents and then their fellow aristocrats to steal their fortunes. Perilus and Xanthippus were sons of Pericles. They and their father died early in the war and the plague that struck Athens. In addition to Protagoras, the sophist Hippias of Elis also has two dialogues, and Prodicus of Chaos attended. Prodicus was a source of the legend where Hercules encountered Lady Vice and Lady Virtue, where they both told him of their allures. And this story was also retold by St. Justin the Martyr and Xenophon. Plato respected Prodicus more than the other sophists. The sophists were foreigners, none were involved in the war. We also note that several of the students of Protagoras, including Alcibiades, were accused of profaning the mysteries, possibly vandalizing the Herms before the disastrous Sicilian expedition. And that was a stunning military defeat for Athens, where they lost nearly all their navy. That contributed to her eventually losing the war. Alcibiades was blamed for this loss, though the fault should rather be placed on those Athenians who repeatedly drove Alcibiades into exile when he was on the cusp of victory. And back to the dialogue where we're walking to meet Protagoras, the sophist. The dialogue Protagoras opens with Socrates' companion saying he's chasing down the fair Alcibiades, saying he recently left his youth by growing a beard. In this discussion, Socrates says that he has seen him, but then rejoins. But shall I tell you a strange thing? I paid no attention to him, and several times I quite forgot that he was present. And his companion asks Socrates if he has discovered a fair love. And Socrates responds that yes, Protagoras is in town, whom he calls the wisest of all living men. Now was Socrates being ironic? Was Socrates jesting? In the apology describing his trial and execution, Socrates tells the jury that a friend had asked the oracle at Delphi, who is wiser than Socrates? And the oracle answered that there is no one wiser. And in his trial, Socrates asks the jury, why do I mention this? Because I am going to explain to you why I have such an evil reputation. When I heard this, I said to myself, what can the God mean? How shall we interpret this riddle? For I know I have no wisdom, small or great. And what does he mean when he says that I am the wisest of men? And yet he is a God and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. Now, was this an act of hubris on Socrates' part? Did this contribute to the jury's eventual decision to pronounce him guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens? And just then, in the dialogue of Protagoras, Hippocrates knocks on Socrates' door, asking him, Are you awake or asleep? Hippocrates has heard Protagoras is in town, and he wants Socrates to introduce him. When Socrates asks him whether he wants to study to become a sophist, Hippocrates is embarrassed and says he only wants to learn skills useful for his rise in politics. Now, the major criticism Socrates has against the sophists is that they charge for their teachings. And if we were to believe his biographer, Diogenes of Laertius, Protagoras charges Ivy League level tuition. Socrates ironically tells his friend Hippocrates that if you give him money and make friends with him, he will make you as wise as he is himself. Sophists did not have a good reputation with the citizens of Athens. Although Protagoras was popular with the politically ambitious Athenians who wished to learn the art of rhetoric or clever speech. Since his beloved Socrates was tried and executed by a large Athenian jury on charges of corrupting the youth in impiety towards the gods, and was painted as a sophist by the playwright Aristophanes, Plato was eager to both denigrate the sophists and show that Socrates resolutely opposed the sophists. And when we reviewed the scraps of the biography of Protagoras and the handful of fragments of his works, these affirmed his poor reputation. But their compilation could have been influenced by Plato's dialogues. Socrates asks Hippocrates how a sophist can make him eloquent and whether that is important. Isn't there more at stake when you decide who will teach you philosophy? Socrates asks. When your soul is in question, which do you hold to be of far more value than the body? And upon the good or evil on which depends the well-being of your all? About this you never consulted with either your family or your companions. You call him a sophist, but you are manifestly ignorant of what a sophist is. Socrates urges, knowledge is the food of the soul, and we must take care that the sophist does not deceive us when he praises what he sells. Socrates warns that the phony philosophers are ignorant of the effects of their teachings have on the souls of their followers, and that there is far greater peril in buying knowledge than in buying meat and drink. And what does Protagoras teach his students? Plato Socrates showed his hostility to the sophists early in the dialogue. Now when they knock on the door of Callias' house, where Protagoras is staying, the servant opens the door. 
takes one look at Socrates and then proclaims that this house has quite enough sophists and slams a door on him. Socrates knocks on the door again and has to convince him that he is not a sophist before he is allowed to enter with Hippocrates. When Socrates is admitted inside, he tells Protagoras that his young friend Hippocrates has a great natural ability and that he aspires to political eminence and that he thinks that conversation with you is most likely to procure this for him. And Plato has Protagoras saying that the art of the sophist is of great antiquity and that he understands that the student should be cautious in selecting a teacher and that he does not believe in deceiving anyone in this purpose. He says that I acknowledge myself to be a sophist and instructor of mankind. He does not conceal this. Socrates asks Protagoras whether he will help his students become better men. Plato has Protagoras answer that he will not bore him with academic drudgery as do many other sophists that Hippocrates will learn with him all that he has come to learn, that he will learn prudence in affairs private as well as public. He will learn to order his own house in the best manner, and he will be able to speak and act for the best in the affairs of the state. This is perhaps analogous to the advice given by St. John Climacus, who, in the first rung of the Ladder of Divine Ascent, warns us that we should pick our spiritual advisor, and for us that means uh, our priest or our pastor, with great care, if we are to dutifully follow his spiritual advice to improve our soul. Perhaps Protagoras selling his services, hoping for generous fees, is telling Socrates what he wants to hear, for these are noble Socratic goals. Socrates then asks him if that means he intends to teach him the art of politics, and that you promise to make these young men good citizens. When Protagoras says yes, Socrates doubts whether this is an art that can be told, or even communicated to another man. Socrates and Protagoras agree that the components of virtue are justice, reverence and holiness, temperance, and finally courage. Socrates asks Protagoras if the components of virtue are one, or if they are separate components to virtue. Protagoras says that they're separate, and wisdom is the greatest. And then Socrates forces Protagoras to admit that this means wisdom and justice do not need to be the same, which means that the wise can dispense with justice. Now, in most Platonic dialogues, Socrates does most of the talking, asking questions to trip up those whom he entraps in his discussions. But not Protagoras, he does most of the talking. And to prove his point, he has a long retelling of the myth of Prometheus. And this takes up more than 10% of the dialogue. And it was a rhetorical masterpiece, flawlessly executed, generating applause. So the sophists could avoid directly answering the question at hand. Sophists had any such set pieces ready to deliver at any time. But it is an interesting speech. And so Socrates does not wish to be implied and interrupt him. And when the speech is played out with this clever ending, Socrates calls it a long harangue, like banging brazen pots. In the myth of Prometheus, our hero steals fire from the gods. His punishment is to be bound to a rock, and each day he endures the pain of an eagle, a representation of Zeus, eating his liver. Each night his liver grows back, and each day the agonizing cycle begins anew. And in some versions of the myth, Prometheus also creates men from clay. Plato has Protagoras adding some elements to the myth, which ancient people often did, in his retelling, the gods ask Prometheus to assist in the creation of all creatures, but he only supervises. He has an assistant, Epimetheus, to distribute the qualities to each creature. And the footnote says that in Greek, the name Prometheus means forethought, and Epimetheus means afterthought. And Epimetheus does appear in other retellings of the myth. Now, in this dialogue, to some, Epimetheus gave strength without swiftness, while he equipped the weaker with swiftness. Some he armed, some he left unarmed. Now, my father would have added to this, and he was a welder, but he had some philosophical leanings. He said that those who were not too bright, that at the time of creation, when the Lord was handing out brains, they thought he said trains, and they said they didn't need any of that. Going back to the myth, Protagoras explains that the unwise Epimetheus forgot that he had distributed among the brute animals all the qualities he had to give. And when he came to man, who was still unprovided, he was terribly perplexed. Prometheus came to inspect and found that man alone was naked and shoeless and had neither bed nor arms of defense. So he stole the mechanical arts and fire from Athena and Hephaestus and gave them to man. Among the animals, only man could sacrifice to the gods, but they did not possess the art of governing. And Plato's Protagoras says, Zeus feared that the entire race of men would be exterminated. So he sent Hermes to them, bearing reverence and justice to be the ordering principles of cities and the bonds of friendship and conciliation. To all, said Zeus, I should like them all to have a share, for if cities cannot exist if a few only share in the virtues, as in the arts. And further, make a law by my order, that he who has no part in reverence and justice shall be put to death, 
for he is a plague to the state. Why should men study the art of virtue? Protagoras has Prometheus answering. If a man is wanting in these good qualities which are attained by study and exercise and teaching, and only has the contrary evil qualities, other men are angry with him and reprove him. And of these evil qualities, one is impiety and another injustice, which are the opposite of political virtue. The dialogue of virtue continues. Protagoras reveals that he views that what other men think is the standard of morality. Do sophists believe that there is absolute virtue that on rare occasions only one man or one leader in the community possesses? Protagoras then spends time discussing the value of civic education. But then he proclaims that his teaching definitely makes a man noble and good, and I give my pupils their money's worth. And he then even claims that if they consider his fees to be too high, they can go to the temple and inquire from the oracle the proper fee they need to pay. Now, I've been in business myself, and only someone whose fees are up at the top end of the scale will say something like this. In my professional experience, attorneys who charge top dollar excel more in greed than incompetence, and they often win cases more by being a bully rather than through legal acumen. And Socrates, after commenting on how brilliant a speech this was, says that he disagrees that virtue can be taught. He directly asks Protagoras, I want you to tell me truly whether virtue is one whole, of which justice and temperance and holiness are parts, or whether all these are only the names of one and the same thing. Then they agree that courage and wisdom are also part of virtue. Why is bravery and courage so elevated? Both Socrates and Protagoras agree that courage means, first of all, to join in the battle to defend the city-state. Later they pick up this debate again, agreeing there is a difference between purposeful courage and impetuous foolhardiness. And we are again reminded that the ancient Greek culture is a warrior culture, that all citizens must be ready and eager to defend the city-state in war, lest they be defeated and plundered. And if that happens, they risk that all their military-aged men would be slaughtered and their women and children would be enslaved. They embark on a long Socratic diatribe. They agree that temperance should be part of virtue. Socrates then trips up Protagoras in an apparent illogical position that is really caused by the imprecision of language, as words in all languages can have multiple meanings. For example, when I was learning Spanish, I learned that langostos is the Spanish word for lobsters. And when you read the Gospels in Spanish, you read that John the Baptist in the desert wore animal skins and ate only honey and langostos. How can this be? Well, in Spanish, unlike English, the same word is used for both lobsters and locusts. Socrates traps Protagoras into agreeing that each component of virtue has an opposite, and only one unique opposite. Then he asks why folly is the opposite of both wisdom and temperance, which either proves that the virtues share opposites or that the unique opposites share words. But Protagoras instead poses a weaker argument, and infers that truth is relative and not absolute. And there's another clever speech by Protagoras which draws applause, and Socrates is then ready to leave. But first Callias, and then Critias, the future bloody tyrant, and Alcibiades, whom the Athenians blamed for their loss in the war, they all argue that Socrates should continue the argument. But it is Prodicus, the sophist most highly regarded by Plato and Hippias the sophist, who urge that both sides be impartially heard, that they not wrangle, but argue out of goodwill, so all may learn from the debate. And then they discuss the poets and how they add to the discussion. They quote Hesiod from his works and days. On the one hand, hardly can a man become good, for the gods have made virtue the reward of toil. But on the other hand, when you have climbed the height, then to retain virtue, how difficult the acquisition is easy. And Socrates and Prodicus discuss whether being good is the same as becoming good, which is another way to ponder whether virtue can be taught. And Socrates has a romantic notion of good and evil. Neoplatonists and St. Augustine believe that evil is not a force to itself, and that evil is simply the absence of good, and that evil at its core is nothingness. But here Socrates defends a more extreme version of this belief. No wise man will allow that any human being errs voluntarily, or voluntarily does evil or, or dishonorable actions. And all who do evil and dishonorable things do them against their will. Now, St. Augustine teaches us that we should interpret Scripture with a view that we should love God totally, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we should love our neighbors ourselves. And Christians should likewise view philosophy in the same manner, allegorizing or discarding that which conflicts with this view. And this implies that love is a choice that we can choose. But modern psychology and neurology does reveal that indeed, and we're speaking of the demented and the deranged, there are people who have no free will. They have no control over whether they violate social norms. Their raw emotions control them. 
Socrates then asks Protagoras, is living pleasantly good while living unpleasantly and evil? And Protagoras answers yes, if pleasure be good and honorable. And this is suggestive of Epicureanism, where we live for pleasant times with our friends, when we live for the weekend, which is really the predominant popular philosophy of our modern age. One of Socrates' more controversial students was Aristippus, the founder of the hedonic Cyrenaic school of philosophy, which may have influenced the later Epicureans under Epicurus, whose philosophy could be characterized as Stoicism light. And the translator summarizes Socrates' position. That Socrates states his conviction that when one is sure about what is right, the pursuit of pleasure will not stand in the way of doing it. Yielding to pleasure is nothing but a miscalculation of the consequences of our action. Socrates concludes this part of the discussion by noting that there is nothing mightier than knowledge, and that knowledge must have the advantage over pleasure and all other things, even though pleasure often gets the advantage even over a man who has knowledge. This reminds us of Solomon, the wisest man of the Bible, whose wisdom is corrupted by the temptations of his many foreign idolatrous wives. So perhaps the debate of whether virtue can be taught or can be reframed, is virtue a skill that can be taught or is virtue something we choose? Do we passively learn virtue or do we acquire virtue by acquiring good habits by living a godly life? Education is critical for both Protagoras and Socrates. And that is indeed the theme of the writings of the early monastic church fathers. Education is critical for both Protagoras and Socrates. For if we wish to choose virtue, pondering on the nature of virtue is needed to avoid being deceived. The sophists, eager to gain students to maximize their fees, tend to teach rhetorical tricks to defeat political opponents rather than political virtue. They teach the relative wisdom that the culture prescribes. Socrates and true philosophers teach the everlasting objective wisdom, the ideal wisdom of the forms, the wisdom that leads to true virtue. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Our main source, of course, is the Dialogues of Plato. We found this collection of the Platonic works in Barnes & Noble. There's also books available that uh, have all of the main Platonic dialogues. And St. Diogenes of Laertius has a short section on the life of Protagoras, and he's covered in Frederick Copleston's book. And these books are discussed in more detail when we discuss the sources in our video on the life and fragments of Protagoras. There are also three lectures in the teaching company that are excellent discussions of the Platonic Dialogues. And unfortunately, these have not been moved to Wondrium quite yet. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.